Okay, good morning. Uh, today we are going to continue the discussion on uh, lubricating oils, and I discussed few properties with you. Now let's look at uh, how the diesel engines perform. Uh, the expectations, what is expected from diesel engine lubricating oils in uh, balanced formulations. So, you see the lubricating oil composed of two main groups of chemicals or substances, one is called base oil or base stock. Base stock really means that it is a refinery product. So, when fuel is taken out, whatever is left out, it is a larger molecular weight substance which forms bulk of the lubricating oil and it provides lubricity. So, these could be mineral oil based, mineral oil based means that base stock uh, is refined in the refineries or this could be synthetic. Synthetic would really mean that you will take some hydrocarbon and you will polymerize it to form larger carbon chain length and which you can use as base stocks. So, uh, from 75 percent to 88 percent of the volume is base stock, okay. only 10 to 12 percent is additives. I okay. will discuss about additives uh, little later. So, base oil alone cannot provide all the required functions that are expected from a lubricating oil and therefore, you know we need to add different additives into it. For example, we discussed in our uh, previous classes that it is expected that the lubricity is maintained in a very wide temperature range ranging from minus 20 degree centigrade to 50 degree centigrade environment. Okay. You are expecting the same lubricating oil to perform from Ladakh to Jaisalmer in the peak summer. Okay. And then when the engine starts, the engine temperature oil temperature goes up to 90, 100 and then at that time also you expect that it should give you reasonable viscosity. But we have seen that if you take any hydrocarbon fuel, <coughs> the moment you start increasing the temperature, the viscosity starts coming down and therefore, the lubricating properties also start coming down. Okay. So, you have to add different additives in order to combat this reduction in viscosity. So, this is called viscosity modifier. So, a large group of chemicals which are called viscosity modifier modifiers are added and this could this could be 5 to 10 percent by volume depending on the application and there could be some other packages which could be up to 10 to 20 percent of the volume of the lubricating oil. Uh, what are these packages? I will discuss in detail. So, I, as I said <coughs> we look at the structure of the lubricating oil, <coughs> there is a base stock which forms the majority of the lubricating oil. It could be mineral, mineral mist uh, refined from the petroleum or it could be synthetic that means man made or synthesized. Okay, when you synthesize something obviously, you can control the properties much better. Okay. So, this synthetic lubricating oil is highly engineered material. So, its properties are more controlled, it has better properties, but then again its disposal after its life is over is also difficult. I okay. will discuss some, some of those things later. Additives could be organic additives, additives could also be inorganic additives. So, base stock provides viscosity for control of friction and wear because it forms the bulk of the lubricating oil. It also provides corrosion and oxidation resistance and it provides the heat transfer in different components. And the additives basically whatever properties base stocks have they enhance the existing base stock properties. Okay. They suppress the undesirable base stock properties. For example, you know base stock is just a hydrocarbon when it undergoes high temperature environment in the engine and there is presence of moisture and there is presence of oxygen, what will happen? Oxidation of the base stock will happen and once the oxidation happens, you will start forming gel and the lubricating oil viscosity will start increasing, it will not provide adequate viscosity and then it needs to be changed. Okay. So, you need to protect, you need to put in some chemicals which stop this reaction. It is a very, very bad news if the base stock gets starts getting oxidized. So, oxidation is a bad property and therefore, you need to put some chemicals which are going to suppress this undesirable property. They also impart some new properties that are desirable from a good lubricating oil. Okay. So, this is what is the main function of base stock as well as additives looking at a very high level. Okay. Now, if we look at the mineral base stock, I will first discuss about 
base stocks and then we will look at the additive packages, what are the additives, what are the functions, how do they work etcetera, etcetera. So, if you look at the base stock, they are derived from petroleum crude oil and we, we have seen that base stocks actually come out in the fractional distillation column through a series of solvent and distillation subtraction processes. Approximately 95 percent of the lubricating oils available in the world today are mineral based. So, synthetic lubricating oils are only 5 percent of the market, 95 percent is still mineral based because they are cheap. Okay. If you engineer something the cost goes up. Okay. So, the synthetic lubricating oils are more expensive, of course, they last longer also, but their market is really, really small because of the cost issues. Now, we have we all know that what is paraffin straight chain hydrocarbon, then branch paraffin, then naphthenes and then aromatics. So, depending on what kind of uh, petroleum do we have, the base stocks can also be categorized accordingly. For example, if you have a petroleum which is dominant in say paraffins, then you have a something called paraffinic base stock. Okay. So, paraffinic base stock will basically have 45 to 60 percent paraffin, 20 to 30 percent naphthenes and 15 to 20 percent aromatics and there may be some wax, asphalt, sulphur etcetera, etcetera. If you look at the naphthenic base stock which is this type, you have a, at least one ring single, single bond ring in the molecular structure. Then you see the naphthenes will be dominant here, 65 to 75 percent will be naphthene and then a paraffin component and aromatic components will be very low and there could be aromatic base stocks. So, aromatic base stocks are basically quite dominant in aromatics, there will be very little paraffin and base stocks will be 20 to 25 percent and they will have large amount of naphthenes as well. Okay. So, this is how the base stocks are categorized and they are based on <coughs> what is the starting material as far as the petroleum is concerned. Okay. <coughs> now, if we just compare when we use naphthenic base stock, when do we use paraffinic base stocks and so on. So, I am just comparing these two out of the three which are most popular. So, naphthenic base stocks are used when you have low operating temperature, you have low viscosity index. Viscosity index as I do you know what is viscosity index? Viscosity index is a property which, which basically governs the change in viscosity with increase in temperature. Okay. So, if you have a liquid, you change the temperature and if its viscosity decreases quite substantially, that means it is low viscosity V i low viscosity index. And if the, the, the fluid resists the change in viscosity and by increasing the same amount of temperature, if the viscosity does not change that much, then it is called high viscosity index fluid. So, naphthenic base stocks are low V i paraffinic base stocks are high V i, paraffinic base stocks are used in high operating temperatures such as engines, IC engines. Okay. Naphthenic base stocks are low pore point uh, fluids and then paraffinic base stocks have higher pore point fluids. This is viscosity pore points and this is wax pore point, they have good additive solvency and they have higher flash point. Naphthenic base stocks are more scarce. Let us look at synthetic base stocks now. So, this is the story about the natural the naturally available mineral base stocks. So, now let us look at the synthetic base stocks, these are basically main mad materials similarly similar to plastics. We also synthesize plastic, how do we make plastic? So, we have this ethylene okay, and we polymerize it and you keep on polymerizing it depending on the conditions carbon chain length formation takes place and whenever we want we can snap the carbon chain length. So, we basically engineer the molecule, molecular carbon chain lens. In a similar way, we take hydrocarbons and we start making base stocks, mineral based synthetic base stocks, sorry synthetic base stocks from petroleum products. Okay. These are chemically identical molecules designed by scientists and these structures are precisely planned and controlled and therefore, their pr properties are also planned. Okay. Naturally occurring low molecular weight compounds are enlarged or polymerized by chemical reactions and thus forming high molecular weight structures of desired viscosity. We also know that there is a relationship between the length of the carbon chain length and viscosity. Lesser will be the carbon chain length, 
lower will be the viscosity, higher will be the carbon chain length, more will be the viscosity, right? Right. So same way, you know, you can you can design the carbon chain length, and therefore you can have desired viscosity of the product. And they have more predictable properties because you can control the carbon chain length. Okay. So approximately three to five percent lubricating oils are synthetic based stock oil. So advantages are, you know, the you can have higher flash point and lower pore point. You can have wider thermal operating range. So the applications where the temperature changes quite a bit, you can use them. Okay. They are fire resistant. Okay. Fire does not take place. They have improved lubricity compared to mineral based stocks. They have higher oxidation stability. So they do not get oxidized that easily. They have higher resistance to change in viscosity with change in temperature, higher VI. They have improved shear resistance, they have lower friction. Okay. They have natural detergency. Now, what is this detergency? So, detergents, as you know, what, what are detergents used for? Detergents are used for cleaning something. Okay. You clean your clothes, you clean or clean the floor. Similarly, in the context of the engine lubricating oil, detergency means that how much the lubricating oil can clean the surfaces, because all the surfaces inside the engine will, will have some kind of deposits, carbon sooty material deposits. It is important that you keep on removing those sooty deposits okay, in order to keep the surfaces clean, because you know that if the carbon deposit is more, the wear will also be more soft material is available in the interface and this will lead to three body wear mechanism leading to more wear okay. and also sooty layer on the inside the engine affects the heat transfer. So, in the engine will start running hotter and hotter and create all kinds of problems. So, therefore, it is expected that lubricating oil will wash away all those things and keep this suspended in the in the lubricating oil itself. That is, this is called natural detergency properties and they have extended oil drain intervals. You must have seen that some of the companies earlier, you know, if you look at 5 years or 10 years back, the manufacturers will say that you, you know, you have to change the lubricating oil after every 5000 kilometer or 7000 kilometer. But now they have extended these periods to 18000, 20000 kilometers, 25000 kilometers. In fact, some of the companies in the uh, United States and Europe they just fill the lubricating oil and then you know it lasts as long as the engine lasts. So, so that means they, they are now going for more and more use of more and more refined synthetic lubricating oils, which have very very highly extended drain intervals. This is possible only because of the synthetic lubricating oil formulations. Okay. <coughs> but you know there are some costs, some, some issues also. And one of the first issue is that since it is a highly engineered material, the costs are going to be much higher and that is why the market share is less than 3 to 5 percent. Okay. Their disposal is extremely hazardous. So, once the lubricating oil, oil life is over, how are you going to dispose it off? So, that is a that is a very very hazardous material. It has high toxicity compared to natural uh, lubricants and then it has seal compatibility issues. So, if there are any rubber components or seal that are used inside the engine, uh, so they have the seal, they attack the seal and they are sensitive to the contaminants. So, therefore, it is important that you have a very, very effective air filter and there should be no contamination from external uh, contaminants. Some of the examples are poly alpha olefins. Okay. Then alkylated aromatics, so these are the synthetic lubricant based stock. Then cyclo aliphatics, then dibasic acid esters, okay. polyol esters. So, these are some of the examples. You know other than this, there are some water based fluids, which are also used as lubricant, but not inside the engine. Where they are used? Water based lubricants. You must have seen that in most of the machining processes, right? You have a white fluid falling at the interface of the workpiece and the tool. What is that? It is a coolant and it's a, it has lubric. It's a it's a water-based liquid. Okay, so water-based liquid can be uh, polyglycols or oil synthetic blends, or it could be water in oil or oil in water. Okay, 
So, you can have regular oil in water or you can have micro emulsion format of oil in water. Okay. So, this is mostly used in machining processes. Okay. Possible advantages of this is I am just telling you it is although it is not related to engines, but I am just telling you so that you know you understand what kind of fluids the total spectrum are available because ultimately it is the same family. So, possible advantage is low cost and fire resistance and it has non hazardous dis, uh, disposal and the, the disadvantages are viscosity and lubricating stability is a big issue and they have to be changed more frequently. Corrosion they cause corrosion and they have uh, additive stability issues and they have a limited temperature range in which they can be actually used. So, coming back to a typical uh, lubricating oil uh, formulation or composition, this uh, figure shows a typical composition. Now, it is not necessary that you have to follow these numbers. Okay. These numbers I have put just to give you a rough idea of what is the proportion just to give you a sense of it. These numbers can be plus minus 1 or 2 or 5 okay, depending on what application are we using. For example, if you look at this pie chart <coughs> base oil could be 80 85 percent then there could be 7 8 percent 5 percent viscosity index improver and 10 11 percent you know other additives. Okay. So, this is the total lubricating oil. Now, let us look at this 11 percent fraction in more detail. Okay. So, 80 85 percent base stock 5 to 7 percent VI improver and about 10 percent 10 15 percent additives. Now, out of that 10 percent what are the different additives that we are looking at. So, this one is the distribution of 10 to 15 percent additive package almost half of it is dispersants. Okay. Then there are detergents and then there are anti wear agents, then there are friction modifiers, then antioxidants, then rust inhibitors, pore point depressant and finally, foam inhibitors. So, these are the different types of additives that are used. Now, you will ask me you know this is very confusing what is dispersant, what is detergent, what are the functions, how do they work I will explain them, okay. but these are the names or groups of additives that you should be familiar with. Okay. <coughs> Let us look at dispersants. Okay. Dispersants could be basically nitrogen and hydrocarbon based compounds. If you look at detergents or detergent inhibitors, these could be sulfonates, phenates, salicylates and they may contain alkylic ma alkaline metals. Okay. This is little chemistry, but I just want to give an impression. Uh, many companies spend lot of money in uh, developing these lubricating oil formulations and actually it is a big market okay. and they do not tell you exactly what this is, because this is they, they engineer these materials and they spend millions of dollars in developing them. So, this is one science which is uh, really not that much available in public domain. Okay. <coughs> Anti wear agents, uh, the most important anti wear agent is ZDDP. Okay. ZDDP is di zinc dithiophosphate, zinc dithiophosphate, zinc actually some word is missing here that is zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate. So, ZDDP zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate. So, basically, ZDDP is the most important anti wear agent. If you look at the rust and corrosion inhibitors these could be detergents also ZDDP acts as a corrosion inhibitor or rust inhibitor, triazoles and thio, thiodiazoles these are also other families of the components uh, the chemicals that are used. Antioxidants one of the most important antioxidant is ZDDP, then there are phenates, phosphonates, salicylates etcetera etcetera and then if you look at the anti foam agents different types of silicon oils are used as anti foam agents. Then there are friction modifiers and then there are viscosity modifiers, viscosity modifiers include hydrocarbon or oxygen based uh, compounds. Now, you see this is the total spectrum of the anti uh, uh, additives that is used. The question is that you have different applications. So, is it that you are going to use all the uh, additives in all applications or you are going to be selective. 
So, the answer to that question is that you have to be selective based on your application. For example, the additives have to be added based on the application, what kind of environment the lubricant has to work in. For example, if it is a diesel engine, diesel engine should certainly have antioxidants because lubricating oil will have the kind of conditions will, ha will, will have to be in the condition where there is a high possibility of oxidation. Corrosion inhibitor, you have corrosive conditions, so it should also have corrosion inhibitors. Detergents and dispersant, because you know it has to do lot of cleaning activity also inside the engine. Anti wear additives also need to be added, because it has to protect the surfaces from wear. It should not form foams okay. and then you know the alkalinity improver, most of the lubricating oils are basic in nature. Why they are basic in nature? Because during combustion lot of gases, acidic gases form and acids form. If you do not have basic nature, these acids are going to attack the lubricant. If these acids are formed and they, the lubricating oil is exposed to it, the, L, uh, the bases will actually react with the acids and neutralize them. Okay. That is why you have alkalinity improver. But if you look at steam turbine compressors, you know steam turbine compressors do not have many of these things. For example, they will certainly need antioxidants, they will certainly need corrosion inhibitors. But they will not need detergents and dispersant because there is no soot that need to clean. They will not have anti wear, they will not have anti foam issues, they will just have anti emulsifier because you do not want emulsions to form. Okay. Similarly, if you look at gear spiral gears or bevel gears or hypoid gears, anti wear, antioxidants, anti foams, and sometimes corrosion inhibitors or extreme pressure additives are required. If you look at warm gears, then EP additives, extreme pressure because gears work under very, very high pressure and under normally under these high pressures, there is breakdown of film. So, at that time the EP additives become active. Okay. So, ex extreme pressure additives are required, if it is in high temperature environment then antioxidant is required and corrosion inhibitor is also required. Hydraulic systems, these set of uh, additives are required. So, th the point that I am making is that <coughs> lubricating oil additive package, it absolutely depends on the application. And obviously, you do not want to put an additive, additives are expensive, you do not want to put an additive which your application does not need, right? it is a wastage of money. So, therefore, the lubricating oil for a particular application has to be used for that application. For example, I will give you a very simple example, you know uh, even I would say that you know the lubricating oil designed for uh, gasoline engine should not be used in diesel engine and vice versa because their requirements are different. The kind of exhaust that they are dealing with, the kind of pollutants that they are dealing with is also different and that is why the lubricants are different. And you certainly cannot use a lubricant used for gas turbine and diesel engine for precisely for this reason. The applications are different, the working environment is different. Okay. Now, let us look at uh, some of these additives in detail. Uh, antioxidants, I will go, I will rush through it because most of it will be chemistry, which will be not so interesting, but you should know actually how they are working. So, there are three main types, hindered and aromatic amines, hindered phenols and dithiophosphate derivatives. So, the proper choice of the type of antioxidant depends on the operating conditions that the oil is exposed to. Okay. Phenols and amines work with radical traps, while ZDDP or ZDTPs work for peroxide decomposers and metal deactivators. So, depending on what kind of attack you expect, what kind of species uh, will uh, you know you expect which will oxidize your base stock, depending on that you make the choice of which chemical you are going to use as antioxidant. Every chemical work for a particular chemical work better for a particular type of attack and you will make a choice. Obviously, you as a customer cannot make that choice, that the choice has to be made by the the uh, oil uh, or lubricating oil manufacturing company for that particular application. So, purpose of the antioxidants or oxidative inhibitor is to prevent the oxidation of lubricating base stock resulting in undesirable byproduct. So, basically you know just to put it very simply antioxidant additive is like a guard to a king. Okay. So, if there is an attack on the king, what the guard will do or what the guard is expected to do. So, he will take the bullet on him, get killed in the process, but save the king. 
right. So, that is exactly the same function that is expected from antioxidant. So, antioxidant is basically a chemical which is sacrificial in nature. Suppose, there is a species that is attacking the base stock and it is trying to oxidize it. So, what it will do is it will go and attack that species and it will kill that species and in the process destroy itself, but in the process it will save the antioxidant which is the king. Okay. So, the, the additive oxidizes in preference to the oil it sacrifices itself and there are like hindered phenol, zinc di, uh, alkyl dithiophosphate. So, hindered phenol are chain breaking you know they break the chains and if there is peroxide, peroxide is a highly uh, oxidizing agent if there is peroxide formation then ZDDP is going to attack it, aromatic amines are also used as ZDDP. So, you see this cartoon actually explains this process. See for example, in the engine environment you have heat, you have air, you have metallic catalyst, different metals are there which act as a catalyst and moisture is there. So, in all such situation you know there are free radicals and peroxide formation takes place inside the engine oil sump and also inside uh, <coughs> the engine. So, what this do is this radicals and peroxide they attack the molecules okay. and when they attack the molecule more free radicals are generated okay. and they attack more and more oil molecules and more and more. So, this is basically a chain reaction and the only thing is that the radicals concentration is going to increase okay. and finally, you know it leads to oil thickening because more and more radicals are joining and then polymerization of the base stock molecules start. So, you have long chain oil soluble molecule formation and this long chain leads to finally, the sludge. As long as it is soluble this remains in the soluble form when the concentration becomes more they start depositing sticking to the walls and this is called sludge, sludge is the insoluble molecules. Okay. <coughs> so, when the antioxidant is present what it does is right when the formation takes place it goes and kills. So, it disrupts the reaction right here okay, and it protects the oil molecules. So, this is how what happens inside a unhindered oxidation chain reaction. When you have hindered chain reaction which is hindered by antioxidants it will come and attack here. Make sense? <coughs> now, let us look at boundary lubrication films. So, boundary lubrication films you know there is something called oiliness agent or friction modifier it is. So, the friction modifier is you know very simple thing it modifies the contact resistance. How does it do? So, it is like this you know if you have if you apply uh, vegetable oil on your skin what happens? It becomes smooth. What is smooth? The contact resistance between your finger and your skin actually changes. It lowers down with the application of one very very thin film of vegetable oil which is nothing but fatty acid. So, in the engine also fatty acid is used as friction modifier, it modifies the contact resistance exactly in the same manner. It is a basically a polar material which forms uniform layer on the surface. So, basically the lubricating oil will form a very very thin layer, but it will be polar in nature. Some react with the surface forming soap, metal soap, metal soap means you will have a large molecule one end of this will stick to the surface will stick and the other end will keep floating in the bulk in the lubricant. When something when the contacting surface when the mating surface comes what it will do? The long chain molecule will not allow the metal the, the mating metal to touch the base, mat, base surface it will be inside that and since it is you know wavering around it will allow that to float and that is how the contact resistance will be reduced. Okay. So, this is how the oiliness agent works. Then you have anti wear additives, anti wear additive also reduces the friction and wear from sliding contact. These are also surface active materials with low shear strength film 
between the sliding surface. So, they also form a surface, but it is low shear strength film is formed. So, so this film will share and this film is formed by ZDDP zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate or tricrisyl phosphate TCP. Okay. So, these there will be lot of acronyms because these chemical names of these uh, molecules or additives are very very complex and these are almost like tongue twisters. So, people have invented these small names, so that they can pronounce it more effectively. Okay. <coughs> there is something called extreme pressure additive. Extreme pressure additives are a specific class of additives, which remain inactive until you have extreme pressure situation. They become active only when there is extreme pressure condition. Extre under extreme pressure what happens is that most of the lubricating oil will squeeze out because of the pressure. At that time they form a ductile film and they reduce the contact friction. So, they react with the surface under high heat and pressure and only under high heat and pressure they form ductile films. They are also surface active compounds of chlorine, phosphorus and sulphur. Now, let us see we have for, for, for uh, reducing the contact resistance we have looked at three things one is the friction modifier, the other one is uh, anti wear additive and the third way third is extreme pressure additive. So, how do they work? So, this these three pictures actually show this very clearly. Say this is the basic paraffinic base stock, this is friction and this is the contact temperature. Okay. This is the basic paraffinic base stock. Now, if you add oiliness agent into it. So, the oiliness agent will what, what, what it will do? It will change the contact resistance at low temperatures. So, you see at low low friction uh, and low temperatures at low temperature the friction is reduced, but as the temperature becomes more the effectiveness of the oiliness agent goes away and therefore, the when the temperature increases the contact resistance also increases. So, what it means is that the oiliness agents are only effective in the low temperature region. Okay. Now, <coughs> let us look at anti wear agents. So, this is the paraffinic base stock just like same and when you have anti wear additives what it does is it does not change the friction at low temperatures but it does not allow the friction to increase at higher temperatures. So, at higher temperatures without you know any additives the friction is going up at higher temperatures, but the anti wear agent does not allow that to happen. Okay. Extreme pressure agent you see extreme pressure agent what it does is that you know this is the paraffinic base stock. Now, this is the gear oil with EP additives. So, gear oil with EP additives means that normally it will follow a trend, but when the temperature becomes very high extreme pressure additive will become active and once it becomes active the friction will decrease. Okay. But now the question is that you know in your application you would not like to have uh, low friction under certain temperature range for your application it is required that you have low contact resistance low friction in a wider temperature range. So, what you can do is you can put this is just an example of gear oil, gear oil with extreme pressure additive and oiliness agent. So, oiliness agent will reduce the friction in low temperature range okay. and when the temperature range increases EP additive will kick in and it will reduce the contact friction. Of course, in high temperature range oiliness agent will be become ineffective, but EP additive will become effective and therefore, you will have low contact resistance in wide temperature range make sense. So, so these kind of additives are developed and you know they are effective only in certain range. So, basically then you engineer for your particular application which additive is going to be become active. So, now you must be getting some sense of how complicated uh, the design of the lubricating oil could be. You have to design first the chemicals, 
and then see in what temperature range they are you know uh, they are active and then you know you have to also see that for your particular application there should be no attacking uh, species which will neutralize them they should remain only then they will remain active for example if you design a, for the engine if you design a additive which is attacked by moisture so within first hour it will go out of uh, contest Now let us look at how the anti wear additives work. So, this cartoon shows it very, very effectively. So, basically, you know, this is a very long uh, molecule, it has a head and it has a tail. Okay. The head is more like surface attractive side. So, the head will go and attach itself on the surface, and the tail oil solubilizing side, which is also called oil solubilizing side it will remain active in the bulk of the lubricant. Okay. So, basically if you have a surface like this, you will have a additive attached to it and you will have some kind of a semi solid surface formed by the anti wear additive on this surface. This is another surface. So, now if there are two surfaces which have some cushion when they glide over each other, it is possible that this will rub against this and it will protect the wear of this end as well as this end. It will not allow the wear of the surface. Okay. So, this is what happens in a in case of a sliding contact. Okay. Anti wear molecules form film by attaching to the surface by the process of adsorption. So, they got get adsorbed. Adsorption is a surface phenomena. So, it is not a volume phenomena absorption is a volume phenomena. Under boundary conditions such as this anti wear film shear instead of surface material. So, this surface will shear it has low shear resistance okay, and it will protect the surface itself that is how it works. Okay. So, anti wear and extreme pressure agents they form a protective chemical boundary between the oil and the engine surface. Most contain sulfur and phosphorus capable of depositing sulfides and phosphorus films on the metal surface. They are also effective as antioxidants and corrosion inhibitor and ZDDP is the most common additive used in most applications. Okay. This is a wonder compound. How does it look like? This is how it looks like. There are many functional groups. Okay. I will not go into chemistry, but you can see this is anti wear film formation process. This is the surface here you have iron compounds and this is the meta phosphate layer that get formed on the surface. Okay. <coughs> Clear? Let us talk about viscosity index improver. I told you that viscosity index is a property of the lubricating oil to resist change in viscosity with increase in temperature. How does it work? So, this is basically made possible by viscosity improvers. Viscosity improvers uh, how do they work? It is shown by this cartoon. So, basically there are some molecules which are almost like springs. Okay. So, they are small in their physical size when the temperature is low and once the temperature increases what will happen? The spring expands and these molecules become bigger in size not in terms of number of molecules. Number of molecules remain same, but they just occupy more space they become larger. And once they become larger, what they will do? The viscosity they will increase the viscosity, right? And what about the bulk of the lubricant? When the temperature increases, the viscosity will reduce. So, there is one component where the viscosity is decreasing, there is another component there where the viscosity is increasing. What will be the net effect? Net effect could be either way depending on what is dominating, but certainly if it reduces the reduction will not be as high, right? it will be less reduction uh, that is what is the function of the extreme pressure uh, sorry viscosity index improver. So, it reduces the viscosity sensitivity to the temperature long chain oil soluble poly polymer they thicken the oil at high temperature by swelling action. So, they swell the examples are so obviously, this is polymeric material ethylene propylene copolymers and polymethyl crylates. So, these are some of the examples and they swell 
when the temperature rises. So, this is how the V i additives actually work. So, lubricating oil you know when the temperature increases there, their viscosity is going to come down, but if they have V i additives and viscosity improvers in them, the reduction in viscosity is not very severe. Friction modifiers improve the fuel economy obviously, because friction modifiers reduce the contact resistance. So, frictional losses in the engine also go down, they are derivatives of fatty acids. Friction modifiers include sulfur containing compounds, molybdenum compounds and graphite and they are surface active agents. They function either by forming multi layered adsorbed film or by forming layers of micro crystalline plates. So, this is one example of how the friction modifier works. So, as you can see this is the iron surface. So, as I told you these are the molecules, this is one molecule, this is another molecule, this is another molecule. This side will have some functional group which will have bonding properties with the surface. So, they will come and bond. So, this bonds, this bonds and this bonds and once they bond there is some kind of cohesive force or, or you know very temporary bonding between these molecules also. So, once it forms once this bond is formed they will form some kind of plates. Okay. So, when the other surface is going to come on it this is going to this is going to not allow this set of molecule film or plate is not going to allow the mating surface to touch the iron surface. Okay. So, therefore, the friction will be low and this film or, or this film or the plate that you are forming it has low shear resistance. This one has very very high shear resistance, when the shear resistance is low the friction is also going to be low as well. Corrosion inhibitors, how does it work? So, corrosion inhibitor could there could be two types of corrosion normally in the engine. One is iron corrosion because many of the parts are iron parts and there could be copper corrosion. What is copper corrosion? You must have seen that copper compounds you know when you leave them they become little greenish. So, that is the copper corrosion. Okay. Iron corrosion you know that red oxide you know red iron oxide forms on the metallic surfaces. So, for any kind of corrosion there are certain essential requirements for corrosion to happen first you should have a iron or copper surface, second thing you should have is a temperature, third thing you should have the moisture and fourth thing you should have is the air. All these four things are required. So, if you want to prevent the corrosion from taking place you have to take one thing out of this equation. So, even if the remaining three are available corrosion will not take place. Okay. So, what you do here is that you have this iron surface, what you do is you have these rust inhibitor additives. So, what they do is they form some kind of film on the metal surface and once this film is formed it is basically it is it is forming a protective layer and it is hydrophobic this film is hydrophobic. That means, if there is any water droplet trying to attack it is going to repel it hydrophobic, hydrophobic means it hates water, hydrophilic means it loves the water it attracts it, hydrophobic means it is going to repel it, it is going to dispel it. So, in the lubricating oil obviously, it is working in an environment where there is moisture, where there is steam as a combustion product. So, some of the moisture actually condense and form water droplets and enters the lubricating oil. Now, this lubricating oil you know these water droplets they want to attack the surface, but they are not able to reach this surface because of this protective layer that is how the rust inhibitors actually work. Okay. So, this reduce the rust formation on the iron surfaces additives is metallophilic and hydrophobic metallophilic means it loves the metal, it goes and attaches itself and it hates water does not allow water to come closer to it, it coats the metal surface and rejects the moisture. The examples of uh, rust inhibitors include long chain fatty acids, naphthalene sulfurates, phosphoric acid derivatives. Okay. So, these are some of the uh, copper corrosion inhibitors this prevents the corrosion whatever is done by iron surface in this case it is done by copper or copper alloys this forms a chemically adsorptive film on the surface just like the rust inhibitors and the examples are chelating compounds of imidazole and 
benzotriazole okay so so there are many chemicals which are used as copper corrosion inhibitors as well <coughs> clear the next set of uh, additives is dispersant detergents and dispersant detergent the function is to um, keep the surfaces clean and dispersant what is dispersant disperse disperse means what keep in peptized form right you must have seen this uh, in the movies that uh, whenever one hero is there in a movie and 20 goons attack him from all sides so he would always like to keep them in different directions he would never like to have five in one direction because if there are five in one direction he can never win the battle so his job is he will throw one on this side one on this side one on this side all four sides he is fighting but he is not allowing them to unite because once there is a united attack he certainly cannot win this is exactly the philosophy followed by dispersant additives also so dispersant additive is the hero here and uh, who is the goon the goon is the carbon particles that are deposited on the surface okay so what they do is basically they do not allow they keep the the carbon particles in peptide form peptide form means they do not allow them to club and form lumps because once the lump formation takes place it is going to come into the oil circulation system and it is going to come it be in between the interface of the piston ring and the liner or some mating surfaces and when these lumps come in between the mating surfaces what will happen the wear will happen because you must have heard this uh, famous saying that it is only it is always the soft material that cuts the hard material it is really true in case of uh, uh, tri tribology it is soft material if the if a soft material particles come in between two surfaces of hard material both these surfaces will be damaged by the soft material by three body wear mechanism okay so the idea is that you do not allow these particles to grow you have to keep them finely suspended in very very small uh, sizes okay so dispersants are used primarily to protect the engine <coughs> operated at low to moderate temperatures keeping the contaminants like soot or sludge in the suspension form it should not form sludge they generally have form they, they are generally ashless containing a polar head and a long non-polar hydrophobic tail the basic nitrogen atoms may be borated or acylated more complex dispersant have been developed to meet more severe requirements so these are some of the uh, dispersant examples of dispersant you can see that uh, they are not simple okay so they are extremely complicated uh, chemical compounds highly engineered okay different this is carbon chain length and different functionalized groups okay many metals are also attached in these uh, additives okay what is detergent so detergent it protects the engines operating at high temperature removing and preventing carbon like deposits in the ring belt area they act as determined keeping insolubles in suspension they neutralize the acids from combustion and provide rust protection again they also have a polar head and long hydrophobic tail and uh, they are made from different uh, compounds such as sodium barium calcium or magnesium ions these are the common uh, detergents that are used in the different types of uh, lubricants examples include sulfonates phenates and salicylates <coughs> so you can see that this is the structure of an over based detergent so what it does is that suppose you know uh, this is the base uh, so they will have some polar head it will attach and the tail will be in the soluble in the oil and it will remove this and take it in the bulk of the lubricating oil so for example if this is the missile 
okay micelle means the carbon particle or something so these will come and heads will attach to this micelle tail will be in the oil and then you know there will be suppose imagine another missile here. So, when this another missile will try to come here and attach with this missile and become larger this will not be happening this will be protected by these additives. So, basically detergent and dispersant the function is to keep the engine surface free of deposits and surround the particles with oil solubilizing molecule to keep them suspended or finely divided. You have to keep them in peptide form. Okay. The examples include organometallic soaps of barium, calcium and magnesium. Increasing amount of contaminants can overload the dispersants causing the formation of deposits and sludge in the engine. Okay. So, this is just an example of uh, uh, detergent test see once the lubricating oils are formed formulated what is done is that you perform engine test and see how do they work in the engine environment. So, this is just a result of uh, loop two lubricating oils and this is the engine piston these are the rings this is the piston top. Okay. So, you can see that in this test there is hardly any carbon deposit showing that it is a good detergency the, the lubricating oil has good detergency. If the detergency is poor you will see lot of carbon deposits. So, basically lubricating oils once formulated have to undergo very very extensive engine testing before they are marketable.